Good morning. Good morning. I'm for starving services today. Got a few announcements here we'll go over. Uh, remember Chief Carol Johnson in your prayers, she had a stroke Wednesday and she has been transferred to a nursing home. Uh, Dwayne Shearer's father is back home again resting at home and he's uh, doing pretty good. And we want to remember Tammy Phillips' sister Kay. <clears throat> She's having issues and her granddaughter needs our prayers also. And Kathy Simmons is recovering at Ohio Valley Health from one left. Uh, she has had some setbacks, but uh, would love to see visitors. And Evelyn Duckworth is very happy to be home and is doing better. And Delta White's son Bill is still having vision problems. Uh, Donnie Hendershot will have his artery cleaned out at uh, Ruby Hospital on April the 12th. I uh, want to remember him in our prayers. And Little Oakley is now cancer free. Uh, her current diagnosis is aspiration pneumonia. And uh, she is on a J tube that bypasses her stomach and she feeds 24 hours a day. Uh, Ruth Lemon is wearing a heart monitor. And she has a uh, feel weak sometimes. And we want to remember Ruth's brother, Blaine, as he has a uh, bladder cancer, stage four. And uh, they started the immunotherapy last Thursday. And Lonnie Huffner is dealing with back pain and is using a walker to get around. And Margaret Odell has been doing, having hip pains, and she has started therapy, and she is doing a little better. Is there anything else on the sick list? All right. Remember all these people, and keep them in your prayers, and, and, and just pray that they all get full recovery. For our uh, events, today is Easter. Everybody have a happy Easter. And uh, Friday, April 14th and 15th, will be the youth rally at Mineral Wells 4-H camp. Uh, Jack Gilchrist will be our speaker. And uh, I suppose there's still a sign-up sheet back there on the back if anybody's interested in helping or donations. And uh, April the 16th is an area-wide worship service at Camden Avenue at 3 p.m. <coughs> is there anything else that needs to be announced on the events coming up? All right, uh, Mark will be leaving our sign. I'll turn it over to him. Our song this morning will be number 13. There is rest, sweet rest at the Master's feet. There is favor now at the mercy seat. For atoning blood has been sprinkled in. There is always a blessing, a blessing in prayer. Blessing in prayer. There's a blessing in. 
so thankful for this another beautiful Lord's Day that you bless us with. And as we look around and see the change in the season, we are reminded that you are in total control of all things and reminded of your power as well. Heavenly Father, we pray that our worship service to you will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we just pray that uh, you be with Elvis and as he brings your lesson to us this morning from your word, and that we will have a ready remembrance of the things that he has prepared. Be with us as students of your word, that we may take the things presented to us, go out into the world, and not just be hearers of your word, but be doers of your word as well, and be servants and a great example uh, as, we, as we represent uh, your word. Heavenly Father, we also pray that uh, you be with uh, Elvis and Ann and uh, their family. We just pray that he will have many years of service to you. And so thankful for the work that he does here at Sunrise. Heavenly Father, we're uh, mindful as well of those who are on the sick list. And we just pray that you guide the doctors and nurses' hands that are tending to them and any caretakers that they may have. And, and pray that your healing hand be upon them as well, that they may have a full recovery and we will resume a, a normal lifestyle and return to services as well. Pray that you be as well be with those who are wanting the loss of loved ones. Just pray that uh, we can comfort them in any way that we can, but uh, your comforting hand be upon them as well. And uh, pray that you be with uh, those as well who work in the mission fields. Many times they work in dangerous places be with them and be with their families and support them. Pray for upcoming events here at Sunrise. We're mindful of the upcoming youth event. And just pray that we will support this event in any way that we can, as well as other upcoming events, gospel meetings, and such. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you forgive us our sins, and we pray that we will remain faithful while we are upon this earth. When this world ends, that we will be granted at home in heaven with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next song will be 337. Oh 
phrase, but I've been hearing it here lately. Happy Resurrection Day. You know, and that's, this is the day that Jesus arose from the grave. Um, you know, as humans, we need reminders. You know, many of us keep daily planners or, or maybe a special calendar that you write appointments or special events that uh, uh, you want to uh, uh, participate in. You know, so we don't forget those. God realizes our need for reminders and has now through the ages um, inaugurated many uh, memorial feasts. You know, the Passover, one of the probably the most uh, recognized of those, uh, celebrates how God with a mighty hand delivered the nation of Israel from the bondage of slavery, from a cruel and powerful taskmaster, you know, and for millennium, Jews have, have kept that memorial feast, that Passover feast. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, inaugurated this memorial feast. The bread, unleavened bread, which represents his body that hung on that cross. And the fruit of the vine, is, which represents his blood that was shed, that takes away the sins of the world. One thing I find sad is that most of the religious world today only does this once a year. Some may do it a couple times a year. Some maybe once a month, but we read in the New Testament that the first century Christians would do this every Lord's Day to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. And if it had not been for that sacrifice, we would still be in our sins. If it had not been for that resurrection, we would have no hope of being resurrected ourselves on that last day. So at this time, let's give thanks for the bread.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for loving us, for calling us by name, Father, for choosing us, for loving us first. For every blessing of life that we receive from your hands, Father, we thank you for your word. Most of all, Father, we thank you for your son and the sacrifice that he made that we might be reconciled to you. I ask, Father, that you bless us now as we partake of this bread that represents his body that hung on that cross in our stead. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Our thanks. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents the, the shed blood of Jesus our Lord, the blood that washes away the sins of the world. We pray, Father, that you bless each of us now as we partake of this. In Jesus' name we pray. That concludes this portion of the worship service. Now, as a manner of convenience, we've also been commanded to lay by and store on the first day of the week. And for your convenience, there's a basket on the table as you leave the, uh, the auditorium if you've not done that already. One hundred fifty nine. I gave my life for thee.
next song will be number 407. 407. All those that can and want to, let's sing to this song. <clears throat> Savior, the God. Six hundred and sixty eight, if you'd like to mark your votes. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Certainly glad you're with us this morning. Happy Easter to everybody. I have to ask you a question this morning, and the question is, what does Easter mean to you? What does Easter mean to you? It might mean something different to, to just about everybody here. Um, I, I go back in memories when I was just a small child and, and kind of what Easter meant to our family and, and the day before we would start coloring eggs and, and you know, part of coloring eggs is eating the eggs the next morning. And I, I enjoyed coloring them. You know, you get colors everywhere it seemed like and that was fun, but I never enjoyed eating them because my mom had a tendency to overboil them. And so once you got to the peeling part, it was hard to peel too because they had been they had been heated, they had been cute, cooled, they had been colored, and everything else. And 
and sat there for all night long, and then he went to eat them and everything. I don't even think she put them in the refrigerator after that point. But then he went to eat them the next day, and 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 I couldn't peel them, so I'd have to ask her to peel them many times, and then I'd get a crunchy egg sandwich the next day. And so that was always great. But, you know, it was, you know, we'd always, it was spring, kind of the introduction of spring. And so, we, you know, uh, you might have your Easter bonnet, your Easter hat, or, you know, your new dress or new suit or something like that. And, and now you can wear those colors that you couldn't wear before because there's some rule that you can't wear whites and yellows before Easter. Remember that rule? Um, I don't know if that rule still applies, but it, it was there back when I was a kid. And, and so, you know, kind of at the beginning of spring and things like that. And then we'd all load up in the car and go to church. And, and so, you know, of course, come home and there'd be a big meal. So for some people, it means the big meal. Others go right to the religious aspect. I want you to understand that the word Easter is not a religious word. It is in the Bible one time in the Old Testament, long before Christ was raised, in one version, the King James Version, and it's not a good translation of what the word means. It means nothing close to resurrection or anything else. So that's a word that from the, from the King James Version, man picked up, the religious world picked up, threw their own meaning behind it, and kind of ran with it. So, you know, when the world celebrates Easter as, as something to do with Christ, it, it, it really isn't something to do with Christ. So the sermon I'm going to preach today has a flair, and really I had started last week with, with Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Christ is preached. It has a flair for, it could be an Easter sermon because I'm going to continue on that way and look at the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But I want you to know that this sermon could be preached any Sunday of the year. Because as Roy mentioned, we gather around the Lord's table as the world many times looks at Easter as a special day. And like I said, you can look at the holiday the way you want to look at it, that's fine. But as religious, as members of the Lord's body, we look at gathering around the Lord's table every single Sunday. And we look at that death, that burial, and that resurrection every single Sunday. And that is important to us, and this is an important subject, and we really have to think about that and look at that. Now, the Apostle Paul maintained that after those redeemed in Christ died, that they would live in bodily form with the Lord in a heavenly kingdom. And the very word resurrection indicates that the body lay in the grave and would come forth from the grave just as Jesus came forth from the tomb. We remember Lazarus as, as Jesus went and waited until Lazarus died. And he appeared there to Mary and the others and, and going into Lazarus. And, and, and this is the passage where you see Jesus wept. Because Lazarus had died. Lazarus meant a lot to Jesus. And then when Lazarus says, come forth, Lazarus, and he raises up from the dead, many people say, well, good thing he said, come forth, Lazarus, because if Jesus would have just said, come forth, everybody who was in the graves would have raised up. And that's probably true, the power of Jesus. But that's our, we hang our hat on that. That's the Christian faith, isn't it? That's the Christian hope. Because if life was just from point A to, to point B, and B, point B being death, and there was nothing after death, then, then we probably wouldn't be here today. There's, there's many other things that you could do this morning. But we know that Jesus did die, Jesus was buried, and Jesus did raise, and because he was raised from the dead, we can raise to walk in newness of life. We, we, we can go to that grave when it's our day and our time, and, and, and when the second coming of Christ comes, we will be raised up to have eternal life with him. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He, you know, he's been raised from the dead, and, and he's the first fruits. And when he appears the second time, the dead will be raised, and Christ will be raised, and, and eternal life will come from that. 
And the revelation is that there is no salvation without the bodily the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no salvation without the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 this morning as we look at our lesson. First, we want to kind of continue where we left off last week and, and, and talk about Christ being preached. That's important, isn't it? I, I can tell you all about things about religion, but if I don't talk, tell you about Christ, I haven't done my job, have I? Because Christ is the most important thing. Because he lived on this earth. He walked on this earth some 33 years. He was an example for us. He was sinless. He went to that cross and died for us. He was buried in that tomb and he rose again for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I would remind you. Now I want you to, to think about that phrase for a second. Have you ever sat there and, and maybe thought about, oh, I remember that time when. You know, I remember that time when, and, and things come to mind when I had my 72 Mach 1 Mustang. Best 500 bucks I ever spent. You know. Now I got in trouble a little bit with that car because it went fast, but I still liked it. You know, or I remember back when you actually got a newspaper delivered to your house. You know, I, I remember back, we went to, not so long ago, went into Detroit, went to Greenfield Village, and as part of Greenfield Village, you can ride in a Model A car. Now, they don't let you drive it. They have professional drivers, but they have about 30 of them or so, and, and they'll, they'll get, you get in and you drive around, or they'll drive you around, and, and it's a Model A. There's several of them, many of them. I remember that time when I don't remember it. I wasn't born. The Model A came out. I remember some older cars, though. I, I remember, you know, if, if I named the best vehicles I ever had, they were Ford Mustang, Ford F-150, and Ford Ranger. I see a theme there, I don't know. Anyway, the GM guys are going, are, are pushing in their seats. But, you know, remember, Paul says, I want you to remember. He's talking to a group of Christians here that's not much different than we're looking at this morning. I want you to remember. Remember Jesus. Re re remember the, the gospel that I preached to you. You received it and you stood in it. Your faith was strong in it. I want you to remember that. Now let's talk about the gospel. You're saved in the gospel. Now, if you hold fast to it, I preach, unless you believed in vain. It, it, you know, you might say, well, there's someone, you, you know, they became a Christian, but their, their, their faith wasn't very strong, and they didn't stand there very long, and, and pretty soon they're back out into the world. You know, Paul might say, well, this is maybe that little category there. He says, but I want you to remember, we need to come back to the time when Christ was there. We need to come back and look at the situation and remember about the gospel being preached and the fundamentals of the gospel that Paul preached and his companions had preached were, were, were teachings that God had raised Jesus from the dead to reign at God's right hand and that Jesus will someday come again. We wait for his coming again. Now, we know two things that are going to happen in our lifetime. One, we're either going to die... And most of us probably think that's what's going to happen. Or two, before we die, Christ is going to come again. So one of those two things, and, and, and because we've known that years and years and years and years have gone by and the same thing has happened, we probably think, well, that would happen to us too. Years and years will go by and we'll be dead and we'll be buried. And maybe, you know, 2,000 years from now or 3,000 or 4,000, we don't know when it will happen. But then but someday Christ will come again. Now, I will tell you this. It seems like the Bible teaches that when we die, until Christ come again, it, it's that time will go quickly for us. Because we'll be in a place, if we're Christians, we'll be in paradise. So they had been saved because they had taken their stand in the faith of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what's due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And to the question of the resurrection of, of the dead, Paul insisted that, that we cannot compromise on, on the Christian faith. 
and those who denied the resurrection of that, there, there were those even in that day that would, you know, I would have a little bit of struggle with this. If you were at the base of the cross and you see Jesus up there and you see him dying and them torturing him, you know, no matter what your belief was at that time, if you see that scene, if you saw the cross and hundreds of people did, and maybe you even see Jesus carrying his cross at some point. Or maybe you even see them putting the crown of thorns on him. Or maybe you saw them beating him. Or maybe you saw part of the trials that were going on. Maybe you saw any of this, this point of action. And, and you know that he died. And you've seen him die. And people said, yes, that man died. And, and then he was buried. And many people saw him that he was buried. And, and then that tomb was empty and that he rose again. And there you go. You see him walking on the face of the earth. And as many as 500 saw him at once. And, and try to come up with 500 witnesses to tell the same story. For 40 days, he walks on the face of the earth. Then in... Acts chapter 1, he ascends into heaven, lies standing, gazing the same Jesus. As you see, he goes up into heaven, will come again in like manner. How can you see that and not say, yes, I understand about the gospel of Christ? I understand. And, and Paul said, I want you to, I, I want to remind you about that. I, I want to take your minds back there. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the scripture, or according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so for humankind, Jesus is the doorway to his reconciliation with God. And because the tomb of Christ was empty, the action of bodily resurrection had already be done. Jesus didn't raise himself. God raised Jesus from the dead. Unless they had held fast to their confession. It's, it's important to hold to your faith. And I know we live in a world where, where, where one Sunday we might come to church and we might get excited and our faith might get pumped up and we're ready to go out there in the world and, and, and by the time the week's up we're like, oh, that's one reason we come back together to, to pump up our faith in the Lord and, and to get excited about God, know that we have a, a God that loves us and, and a Savior that cares for us and has died for us and wants us to, to understand and, and, and preach Him and, and let the world know about Him. Lest they held fast to the confession of their faith they had made from the beginning, their hope in Christ would not be realized. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, they were buried, Paul reminds them. Therefore, with him and by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, when, when we go into the baptistry, this is similar to what Christ did. When we go into the baptistry, we are, die to our old self. We're buried with Christ in baptism. And we come up risen with Christ to live a new life. And we begin that new life. And so we have similarities there. But secondly, this morning Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Now it's interesting, Paul just didn't say, well, these things happen, these things happen, these things happen. But when he says it, he says, according to the scripture, this is where you get your Bible. Now, now if we were to take and take the New Testament and close the New Testament off and set it over here, we could still take the Old Testament and teach Jesus Christ Death, burial, and resurrection. A lot of it from the book of Isaiah. You look at Isaiah 53 and, and, and Isaiah 61 and others, and we can teach that same thing from the book. For a matter of fact, we can look at Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and as he was going down the road, he was reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He came to Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. His led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his Shears was silent. Who is this talking about? He asked Philip. And he began at that passage and taught him Jesus. 
He, he died for our sins according to the scripture. Why did my Savior die because of me? Because I have sin in my life. Why did my Savior die because of you? Because we have sin in our life. For I deliver you, first of all, of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He died for our sins. He, he didn't die because of something he did. He, he, he didn't have to come to this earth because of himself. He didn't have to come to this earth because of any other reason but because of our sins that had to, Christ had to be paid for us. If you ever got to the cash register, maybe not had enough money for your purchase. I know Many of us have bank cards or credit cards or something that if we didn't have enough cash, we could take out that card and hopefully scan that card or something and we'd get our purchase, we'd go on our way. But I've seen plenty of times, and, and I like to get behind people who don't have enough money. You might say, why? See, because if the bill's not much, I'm going to pay it. Now, if it's hundreds of dollars, I'm, I'm going to say, well, it's, I, I can't do that. But if you're $10 short, I'm going to help you. If you're $20 short, I, I might help you. Especially if it's like a mother and her children or something like that. I, I'm going to help you. Jesus is going to help you because we cannot pay our price. We need him behind us to pay our price for us. We, we can't pay the cost. And he had to come and pay our cost for us. He had to die for us. Galatians chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel which I preach to you by me is, is not man's gospel. It's, it's not from, from man, he says. For I did not receive it from, from any man, nor I was like taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul had heard and accepted the testimony of the, revel, of the resurrection Christ had from the apostles and other believers who had gone before him, and he was aware that that to deviate from this message had, had been, you know, been preached before, and his conversion would call his reputation to question. You know, Paul would go out on these trips trying to arrest and kill Christians, and, and many times he would deviate from the message of the cross and, and put themselves in that place and, and teach a different message, and Paul says, I, I can't deviate from that. When Paul wrote that his message was according to the scriptures, his first readers were to understand that it meant the Old Testament scriptures, by the way. In other words, all this stuff was prophesied would happen. If I could tell you what you're going to have for lunch next Tuesday, would you believe me? Now, some of you are very, I have the same thing for lunch every single Tuesday. I know a person that does that. Same thing for lunch. Maybe maybe the same thing for lunch every day. I don't do that. Whatever's in the refrigerator, whatever the leftovers or whatever, you know, that's usually what I have. It might be something different every day. But if I could tell you, you would say, wow, that guy's got something. He, he, how did he know what I'm going to have for lunch next Tuesday? I can't do that unless I know your pattern of life. But I remember Wes, Wes and Helen, what Helen would tell me that Wes has the same thing for lunch every day. I can tell you what it was, but you don't want to know. But you know, Went, same thing every day. Well, we have Old Testament scriptures years and years and years before that said this is what will happen. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6. Or we're looking at Acts chapter 22, verse 22 through 24 first. Men of Israel, hear these words. It's Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourself know this Jesus delivered according to a defined plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified him and killed him by the hands of lawless men God raised him up loosed the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held in other words this Jesus God knew what was going to happen he wrote about it Isaiah 53 the verses 3 through 6, the prophet Isaiah said he was despised. He was rejected by men. Who was that, Jesus? He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one of whom men hid their faces and, and was despised and esteemed him not. You know, sometimes when Jesus would walk in the room, people couldn't look him in the eye. You ever have somebody like that that you just couldn't look in the eye? 
And it's because they had they were ashamed. But remember the woman at the Samaritan well, or the Samaritan woman at, at Jacob's well? She, she wanted to go there at an odd time of the day because she didn't want to be seen by others because she thought others would, would give her a hard time and, and basically make fun of her because she had been married so many times. She had so many failed marriages and she was ashamed of that fact. She just, she just could, was a bad picker, couldn't get along with it, I don't know. But she had issues, and she was ashamed of that fact. So she went there in the, in the heat of the day. And normally you'd come in the morning in the cool of the day, get your water out the well, because you didn't want to sweat while you were getting your water. But she would come, and guess who she ran into? Jesus. At the well, he was despised, he was rejected. Surely he is more our griefs. He bore my griefs. He bore your griefs. He carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him not stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. I want you to notice that with his wounds we are healed. He paid the price, didn't he? He paid the price for you and I. He took the punishment for you and I. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. You know, we take the burden and the pressure of sin in our life and, and it can drag us down, can't it? It can, it can do all kinds of things to us. And God said, I'm going to take this burden of sin and anguish and agony and I'm going to put it on Jesus because he can handle it. He's going to pay the price. He's going to die. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. But when he had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I, I did not immediately consent with anyone. You know, this is a, a, a statement for Paul because Paul thought he had his life together as, the, as, as Saul before he became Paul. He thought he had his life together and, and was doing wonderful, and he was in, in his little bubble, in his little circle. And, and, but what he didn't know is God had chose him before he was born to do this work, to be this type of person. And I wonder what God has chosen for you and I to do in our lifetime. And he, he certainly revealed his son to Paul. Well, finally, of course, we come to this part. He was buried and he was raised. We're going to look at these two together briefly this morning. Paul says that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. And of course, he says, according to the scripture. No part of the apostles' doctrine could precede the, the major truth that Jesus had died and that he was buried and that he was raised the third day. Everything else is followed by that. As I say, we kind of hang our hat on that, don't we? We hang our religion on that. We believe that. We have to stand on that truth. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after he suffered by many proofs. Many proofs. You know, if I, I, I've been to a lot of funerals over the years, and, and that's just part of life, you know. But if I go to a funeral and... and, and little secret here. I guess the preachers are supposed to give their secret. The, the, the preacher and the undertaker are the last two person to see before they close the casket. The, the preacher, in, in this, uh, every part of the country has different customs. One of the customs in this area is that the preacher is there to the very last minute. And then the preacher will escort or lead the casket out of the funeral home. Um, and, and so we see everything. And so we see that person in there. We see them close it. And I, I can tell you how to lock it and everything else. And, and then we see them lead it off, and then we see them take it to the cemetery. It's many times they'll ride in the hearse or the lead car, and, and then we'll see it put it in the ground. And if I saw that person walking around three days later, I'd be like, ooh, I, I would be in shock. I would be utterly in shock. I'd say, well, my first indication would be, well, maybe that's someone who looks like them. 
then I would hear them speak, and I'd get a closer look, and then I know it's not. In this case, I know it's not Jesus. I, I, I would see him. And not only did he do that, he, he took care of unfinished business. And the apostle Peter, he decided to show up for breakfast. Show up for the fishing trip. Help them catch some fish. Fry those fish up. Had some breakfast with them. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 and 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks signs, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, that's in Matthew 12, so that's not even near the end of his ministry. So that must have got them thinking, prophet, Jonah, what are you talking about? Oh, what do we know about Jonah? Jonah, well, he ended up in the belly of the whale, and, and he got spit up. How long was he there? Three days. Oh, okay. Now, I'm sure when, when this resurrection happened, they were thinking, oh, now we can put two and two together and understand that. For it was just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 27, 57 through 61, we see this, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went with Pilate and asked for the body Jesus. You see, they didn't make a whole lot of burial plans. They had to plan to kill him, to hang him on the cross, but, but, but many times they would just shove the body over in a stack in a pile of bodies. Well, if you had a loved one there, you didn't want that to happen, so you would make plans to take him and, and bury him somewhere, wouldn't you? And, and so Joseph of Arimathea, he, he didn't know Jesus that well, but, but he was, you know, I'll, I'll take the body. And you have to go to Pilate and, and, and ask for that. And Joseph took the body. He wrapped it in a clean linen shroud. He, he laid it in his own, his own new tomb. He had bought for himself. Which he cut in a rock. And, and he wrote a great stone to the entrance of the tomb. And, and, and he went away. And Mary Magdalene Mary, and the other Mary were there sitting opposite of the tomb. So he, he takes Jesus and he puts him in the tomb. In his tomb that he bought for himself, and, and he rolls the great stone to close the door. He, he put special linens and burial robes on Jesus. And I want to close with Mark 16, verses 1 through 11 this morning. When the Sabbath was passed, Sabbath was Saturday, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Solomon brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. See, see, this happened, this burial happened so fast that, that, that they really didn't have time to prepare and even prepare the body. So they had to wait till over the, the, the Sabbath had passed because they weren't allowed to do any of these things on the Sabbath. So Sunday morning they come and they're, they're, they're going to roll the stone back, have the stone roll back. These ladies couldn't do it by themselves. And they're going to have it roll back and they're going to go in and they're going to finish preparing the body for burial. And as they arrived, they noticed some things. They started to say to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They didn't know how to get the thing open. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. You can imagine uh, approaching the stone and thinking, okay, I don't know how we're going to get this stone. Maybe there's going to be a gardener. Maybe there's going to be a couple guys walking by. Maybe something's going to happen. And they go and the stone, the doors, the stone's rolled back all night. And they began at this point to be surprised, if you will. At the entrance of the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they began to be alarmed. The man said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified? He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he has gone before to the to Galilee. 
and there you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, from trembling and astonished, and they seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early in the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary and Mag Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept, but when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. It's hard to believe, isn't it? And as we know, the Bible tells us that Jesus was seen many times, and that passage, as we read on, he would be seen. In our passage today, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the next verse says, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Peter, and to the twelve. He appeared for more than 500 brethren. At one time, most were still alive, but some had fallen asleep. He appeared to James and, and, and to all the apostles. Last of them, as to one untimely born, he appeared I would say also to me. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to this earth, that he lived on this earth sinless to be an example, to be the Lamb of God, to sacrifice for us, to pay our price for us, that we can have eternity with him. That because of his resurrection, someday we'll be rised again to walk in newness of life, to, to live in heaven with Jesus and with God. This morning, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you as we stand and as we sing. Because through Jesus, he will save you. Your sins and
Is there anything else that needs to be announced? Hope to see everyone back this evening for evening worship service at 6 o'clock. You'll bow with me, we'll have a prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this opportunity we've had together to gather together to worship your high and holy name. We pray, Father, that the things said and done here this morning were pleasing in your sight. We pray, Father, that as we leave here, that you will be with each of us, give us safe passage to our destinations, and that you'll bring us all back together at the next point of time. In Jesus' name that we pray.